Uh, it is my pleasure today to welcome Dr. Jill Farmer to talk about women and Parkinson's disease. So just a couple of little housekeeping things. Uh, for those of you who have not uh, met us yet, my name is Dr. Jamie Martin. I'm the director of the Movement Disorders Program here at Synapticure. I've been involved in uh, telemedicine for a long time. I actually started a telemedicine clinic back in 2016 for patients with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. And I've really been interested in sort of access to care and how we can get uh, sus subspecialized care to people wherever they are. So for Synaptic Cure, just for those of you who don't know much about us yet, um, we are a patient-founded telehealth clinic that transforms care. Oop, sorry. That transforms care um, and outcomes in people with uh, neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS and Parkinson's disease in all 50 states. So we provide comprehensive virtual care with neurologists who specialize in these disorders. Um, we are currently covered by most major insurances and we're adding more on as, as we speak. One of the most unique things that we offer is integrated care coordination and caregiver support. So anybody who signs up for our services gets assigned to a care coordinator and that person is with you throughout the course of your time with us. And one of the things that we focus on besides just the subspecialized care is also accelerating access or referrals to clinical trials. So right now we don't have any, we have one small trial going on with Synaptic Care, but really it's identifying resources that are available to you at centers that might be nearby, or maybe centers that are near family that you might have access to clinical trials. And then we have a whole host of additional resources like insurance navigation. Um, we have referrals for uh, Parkinson specific or at least neurology specific physical and occupational therapy. Um, we have a, a speech and language therapist that specializes in neurodegenerative disorders. And we are currently right at the gate of uh, opening our services of behavioral health for patient and care partners. So we'll have both psychiatric services as well as psychology available for our patients. And this was a quote by a recent patient of mine who said, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2013. I found everyone at Synaptic Care to be incredibly competent, kind, and compassionate. And I think this is the most important part. For the first time in many years, I could say to my husband, they not only listen to me, but they also hear what I said. And I think this is a perfect lead-in. This is a, obviously a female patient. I think this is a perfect lead-in for our conversation today with Dr. Farmer about the differences that women experience in Parkinson's disease. So. Dr. Farmer, if I could do a quick introduction. She is an assistant professor of neurology and the director of the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Program at the Global Neurosciences Institute. She is a board certified in neurology and has completed a movement disorders fellowship. And as the first movement disorders specialist at GNI, Dr. Farmer developed a comprehensive movement disorders center to address medical management, surgical management, and rehabilitation strategies for patients with Parkinson's disease and other movement disorders. She also developed clinics for botulinum toxin therapy or Botox um, and other brands to treat dystonia and spasticity, as well as deep brain stimulation or DBS to manage Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, and dystonia. She did her training, so her medical degree and her master's of public health at UMDNJ or University of Medicine and Dentistry in New Jersey. She did her neurology residency and fellowship training at both at Georgetown, and she was one of several neurologists who helped create the Women's Neurologist Group, which is an online group of nearly some neurologists who have come together to provide personal and professional support. So again, I know I've said it, it is my pleasure to welcome both my colleague and my friend, Dr. Farmer. Well, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here. I was happy to be asked. I am home today, so I am not in, in my office at work, but my husband is also home and he is working on renovating our front door. We live in a, a 120 year old Victorian and I've given him parameters that he can't bang or drill or do anything. But if he does and it's loud, let me know and I'll go downstairs and remind him again. <laughs> Yeah, all the joys of working from home. I know I've got yeah. my kids are home for the summer. We've got <laughs> the animals. And so right today, talking about women in Parkinson's disease, maybe we can just start with a little bit about why is this an important topic? What is it, you know, what's the, why is this even something that we want to discuss? Sure. So I don't think it goes without mention that recently there has been a push of women in this, women in that, the special um, considerations that might be needed when caring for women patients. So from both, both professional call-outs to patient care call-outs, there is this, it's not even a resurgence, but it's just a surgence of identifying that sometimes women have 
different needs than what is you know, collectively available or has been the culture of management and treatment and the culture of, of professional, you know, groups and societies. And I think that's a good thing. I think that it highlights changes that need to be made with an appreciation of things that we've already adapted to, but just never called out. And now we can. And we were just speaking before we got online that We've, you know, appreciated certain things, encouraging women to participate in research studies and encourage and, and seeing how our medicines respond to women and what their presenting symptoms are and have adapted our clinical practice accordingly. But we've done this anecdotally and we've done this based on our, you know, our clinical experiences and what we bring to the profession as, as women neurologists. But now that it is becoming part of the vernacular and part of the, the, the mainstream, if you will, it allows there to be quantitative instead of just qualitative support behind it. And that's really what's, what's important because when you have data, then you can really change the course of guidelines, treatment strategies, and be able to not just do it because you know it's the right thing to do. And intuitively it feels like what you're supposed to be doing but there can be the 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 gravitas behind it as well like we do need to approach this a little differently because medicine is different for a woman patient so hasn't the research always been in women and men since both women and men get the diseases it, yes and no i would it, it would be wrong to think that there have never been any women in any clinical trials that have been studied but the predominance has been men and there is a, a, a prevalence of Parkinson's being more pronounced in male patients anyway. Um, usually, as if anybody who is on the, 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 the webinar knows if they either are a woman with Parkinson's or if they are a care partner for a, a gentleman with Parkinson's, who really pushed that person to get to the doctor first? It was probably the woman that pushed the man to get to, to, to the office to be checked out. And so that kind of goes without saying where the, the prevalence is what it is because a lot of times women in the background are kind of steering and guiding what needs to be done for others and not necessarily themselves. So there is a bit of a bias. There's also a bias, not just for gender, but when you think of a classic Parkinson's patients from what you've seen in the literature and things like that, it's an older gentleman, tends to be white. And that we know is not the face of Parkinson's. It is varied and, you know, crosses gender, crosses age. There are many different presentations of Parkinson's. But bias and, and traditionally speaking, you think of an older white gentleman who has Parkinson's disease. So it's kind of shaded what we've looked at for recommendations and what we've looked at for treatment paradigms and things like that. So maybe you can talk a little bit about how sort of that background changes, you know, how women are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, you know, are there delays in their diagnosis or delays in their referrals? There are, and there are, there's a growing understanding as to why this might be some of the psychosocial things that I absolutely just mentioned, just women putting others before themselves, delaying their own care to make sure everybody else is taken care of. But there's also a change in the presentation of Parkinson's. So briefly, just for, you know, background, there are three classic types of presentations of Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease. There's tremor predominant Parkinson's, which is what everybody thinks of when they think of Parkinson's because everybody associates it with tremor. There's akinetic rigid type, which is what it sounds like, akinetic, no movement, rigid, very tight and stiff, doesn't have much of a tremor. And then there's the postural instability gait type, which is again, what it sounds like, very significant balance issues early on, very difficult times with initiating gait, taking steps, shuffling, things like that, again, doesn't have much by way of tremor. So about a third of patients almost don't present with a tremor for Parkinson's disease. And across the board, man or woman, those patients get delayed to diagnosis. Now, what is interesting is that most women patients tend to have tremor predominant type Parkinson's. So you would think it would work in their favor that since they have the most commonly associated type of Parkinson's, they would get recognized early, but that's not necessarily the case. And 
it goes along with, as we know, motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's. The non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's that are seen, again, across the spectrum, the ones that are most notable in women tend to be depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, fatigue, things like that. And if you take Parkinson's out of that, if you hear things like depression, anxiety, sleep disturbances, fatigue, it can easily get chalked up, particularly in a younger patient or one that doesn't have very outward noticeable symptoms just yet, that this is something along a, a psychological spectrum. And so that delays the diagnosis again, because, and it's not inappropriate. That's not to say that everybody that has sleep problems, fatigue, anxiety is going to go on and get Parkinson's disease. But if they don't have someone who is trained to kind of tease out some subtleties on exam, like, oh, there was a little bit of a decrement in your finger tap, or you're not swinging one arm as opposed to another when you're walking to let you kind of think that this may be on a dopaminergic spectrum and not something associated with just depression and anxiety and things like that, that can also be seen. It again, delays the diagnosis a bit. Yeah. And I think it's an important point. You know, I had a patient the other day, I've actually, I've been seeing her for many, many years, but there was a significant delay in her diagnosis because a lot of the features were exactly what you described. You know, she had um, some anxiety, some, some psychiatric symptoms that were very different than anything she had experienced in the past. Mm -hmm. And so for her, you know, and, and then just some subtle changes that she, she couldn't quite put words to, although she mm -hmm. started to suspect she may have had Parkinson's, it resulted in a delay. And so I, I think it's important to remind people that, you know, if there is something that you're concerned about to make sure that you're, you know, you try to be as vocal as you can. And, you know, sometimes it can be hard to put words to it, but, okay. uh, you know, don't hesitate to get a second opinion if you do have specific concerns. I know. And it's, it is unfortunate that so much of the onus gets placed back to the patient to be their own advocate. And that adds a, an entire another level and an entire another layer of hurdle and, and difficulty with managing the medical sim, um, system. But, but it is true. So if in your gut, you're feeling that you're not being heard like this, like the um, quote we saw in the beginning, try to seek out individuals that might hear you better. And that if you don't even know where to look, places like Synaptica is wonderful. The larger organizations, even if you don't have a diagnosis of Parkinson's just yet, whether it's the Michael J. Fox Foundation or the Parkinson's Foundation or the PMD Alliance, these places have resources to help you navigate the system to seek a movement disorder specialist in your area. And it is, it is important. People ask, is it necessary that I see a movement disorder specialist? And I think that it is. Is it necessary that it, you only see a movement disorder specialist? Not necessarily. There are not that many. They might be geographically limiting. But if you can at least get either a diagnosis or a confirmation of a diagnosis or something like that from a movement disorder specialist and then follow up with your general neurologist or regular practitioner, whoever it might be, to have that connection to be with you during your journey of Parkinson's is important because again, they'll notice the subtleties that someone else might not. So, and maybe you can, you kind of touched on this a little bit, but what are some of those subtle things that mm -hmm. people can watch out for, or that we, that we, you know, most of us, the movement disorders docs notice even in public now. Yeah. <laughs> It's like, oh, should I tap them on the shoulder? No, that would be socially inappropriate, but I kind of want to. So the the as I mentioned, specific as it as it pertains to women, we're looking at non-motor symptoms. So in the in the constellation of the features of Parkinson's, you have the four cardinal features, the motor features of Parkinson's, tremor, slowness, stiffness, and balance issues. You only need three of those four to be to make a clinical diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. But way back in the 1800s, when James Parkinson's was diagnosing or, or describing, I should say, Parkinson's disease in his first couple of patients, he even then made the comments of cognitive fogginess, anxiety and depression, constipation issues, pain associated with Parkinson's disease. So it was always recognized. It's just that, again, in the culture of treatment, the treatment's always focused on the motor symptoms, the replenishment of dopaminergic tone and medications and things like that. So that's what was looked at. That's what was studied. 
but that's only part of the picture. And in women, there is research to, to look at and suggest that it isn't the motor symptoms. When the motor symptoms present, it is tremor. And so that obviously is an obvious one. But prior to that, there's the word prodromal is a bit controversial, but we know that people will lose up to 70% of their dopamine before they start to show motor symptoms. So there's clearly something happening along the line before that occurs. So if they start to have a loss of sense of smell, or they start to have those sleep disturbances of sleep fragmentation, or more specifically acting out their sleep, very vivid dreams, things like that. If they notice that they are not the master multitaskers that they were, that they once were, that they're not as easily adaptable to social situations. So when they could, you know, host a dinner party of 30 people and then still make sure that stuff was appropriately to their liking in the house, as well as making sure that everybody was going to get home safely and do all of those sorts of things. Now, each one of those tasks seems a bit more insurmountable or that they can't do it. And they have this internal feeling of not quite being right. Like they know something's wrong, but nothing's going to show up on a test. They're going to describe it to their docs when they talk to them. And they're going to be like, oh, you know, everybody's life is stressful. And it is. And you're as you get older, you just have more difficulty managing it or dealing with it. But they can tell they have an intuition, women's intuition, they have that intuition that there is something more than that going on. And those are the things that we're talking about. Even in a movement disorder specialty clinic, like if you are coming with these concerns and there's little to kind of bridge over to the motor symptoms, it's hard for us too to say, okay, we, we're calling this a dopamine deficiency. And then there are things that can be done like a DAT scan, things like that, that might help in very early diagnosis. But usually we'll see the not, we'll hear the non-motor. We'll also hear about constipation and, and irritable bowel and things like that. And again, how many women have GI issues at baseline or urinary frequency and, and, and incontinence issues at baseline after childbirth and things like that. So it's a muddy picture. But again, if you kind of here are the highlights of what that might be non-motor wise. And then we can see again, that little bit of slowness, that little bit of rigidity, that slight cogwheeling, even if the tremor isn't there, then that's enough to give us the idea that this should be investigated further. Absolutely. And, you know, just to, to elaborate a little, you know, when we do look for some of those motor things, you know, you say people do their finger taps or their opening and closing, we're really looking for four things, right? We're looking for the size of the movement, the speed of the movement, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes people say, well, I can go big, but it's slow. If I try to go fast, it gets, you know, smaller. Oh. We look at the cadence of it. Is it a regular cadence or is it sort of broken? And then to your point that what we call decrement, which is it starts off one size and then it sort of gets punier as time goes on. And that decrement is kind of like the movement specialist secret weapon, because that's what we know as being of all of those things, the one that might be most pathologic or pathognomonic for, for making our diagnosis. Right. Lots of things can make you slow. Arthritis strokes, nerve injury, you know, all sorts of things can make you slow, but absolutely those sort of that, that what I tell people is like that petering out of, of mm -hmm. those symptoms is often one of the telltale signs for us. Absolutely. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, you know, we talked about, so in, in the past that research, you know, may have focused to some degree on, on mostly men, although certainly recent studies, you know, we'll try to do, you know, either, either equal numbers of men and women, or at least to match sort of the, the mm -hmm. incidents that we see in the, okay. the population. Maybe we can talk a little bit about wh why do we think there's differences in why, why are there more men that have, that are diagnosed with Parkinson's versus sure. women? And is that true all over the world? And mm -hmm. so it is, if we're talking about gender differences, then we obviously can't not discuss hormonal differences between men and women. And there is some data to suggest that estrogen may be protective in a Parkinson's space. There is also data to suggest that the type of estrogen matters. So your, your natural hormonal potency and, and, and hormonal threshold, not necessarily hormone replacement, because they have seen that in postmenopausal women, 
the incidence between men and women doesn't quite even out, but gets much closer. And then with, if patients take hormone replacement therapy, they might actually have a higher incidence of Parkinson's than those that do not. So the jury is out as to exactly what that all means, but I think people from a pre-menopausal state can feel confident in saying that their reason why there is a higher incidence, um, what we tend to see overall in our clinics and, and, and what's been reported is that there is something protective about the body's natural production of estrogen when it comes to dopamine deficiency. And like I said, unfortunately, that hasn't necessarily been able to be translated into something therapeutic. Like, why don't we just give everybody estrogen and, and see if it stays on that route? And it doesn't seem to. And of course, there are other medical concerns with taking hormone replacement therapy for women as they age and things like that. So if you have a patient that's female and is interested in doing hormone replacement therapy, right? The data is mixed sometimes. Sometimes it says it's safe. Sometimes mm -hmm. it says it may be associated with an increased risk. Mm -hmm. How do you counsel patients on, on what, you know, sure. if it's safe to pursue that? So I don't tell patients that I would pursue it from a Parkinson's point of view alone. And it, nothing in nothing medicine is. happens in isolation. So <laughs> This is a question about estrogen, but this also comes up with patients that also have diabetes and patients that might also be treated with certain types of uh, chemotherapy agents or things like that. Look to the utility of the replacement, in this case, estrogen, for its primary purpose. So if you have had um, a total hysterectomy or if you are using it for purely gynecological issues and the estrogen can be helpful in those regards, by all means, take it. May it have some impact or benefit in a Parkinson's space? It might, but I would never counsel someone to do it predominantly for Parkinson's alone if they didn't have something else more prevalent or more impactful that the estrogen could help with. Absolutely. And I think it's always important to talk to your gynecologist about, you know, is it systemic, right? Something you take by mouth. Is it estrogen? Is it estrogen plus something else? Is it, you know, if it's, you know, local issues, vaginal atrophy, things like Absolutely. that, is it something you can do a suppository as yeah. opposed to, you know, systemic? I think those right. are always important to, to work in, right. you know, concrete, you know. And I was just going to mention that too, because sexual side effects are part of the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is impactful in Parkinson's disease. Women are not necessarily the most forthcoming of any age when discussing, you know, questions about sexual health, questions about intimacy, about pleasure, whatever it might be. And it definitely is something that gets harder as you get older. Although I will say, and this was much to my chagrin and I loved it. I have run multiple patient support groups and patient education programs. And my most my, my best attended and my most lively was the one on sexual health in Parkinson's disease. And I was like, well, that's, you know, my own bias coming in there too, like trying not to talk about it or think about it. And clearly we should just be more open and discuss. And it was a wonderful, like, it was a wonderful program full of lively questions and discussions. So what we think of is not always necessarily the case. So that is something to say, bring it up to your doctor. Don't worry about making your doctor blush and doctors should bring it up to their patients and not worry about making their patients blush. I will say two things. One, just before this, the APDA, American Parkinson's Disease Association, had a webinar on sex and Parkinson's disease, not specific for women, but what little bit I was able to catch, I was really happy to see a lot of times these, these, you know, webinars and the information really tends to focus more on the male side of things. And they really yeah. definitely, you know, talked about the women. So if you get a chance, go check that out. They'll, that'll be mm -hmm. available to watch later. But I think your point too, is, you know, I often try to bring it up because it is, it is on, sometimes it's uncomfortable to bring up, mm -hmm. um, especially to a neurologist, right? It's not yeah. like, you're with your gynecologist where it kind of makes sense. Right. Um, sometimes it's weird to bring it up to your neurologist. And I find a lot of times that people don't realize that it can be associated with Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And, and if, for me, it's a chance to, to educate, especially if they're there with whoever their sexual partner is, yep. it's a chance to educate that, you know, there are, you know, many things that are going in that are physical things that can affect that there are, you know, emotional changes that can affect it. There are medication side effects, right. That can, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes lead to reduced libido. It can lead to hypersexuality, right. Mm -hmm. Too much sexual behavior, mm -hmm. especially in a sort of an inappropriate way or inappropriate settings. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I always tell people, you know, if don't hesitate to bring it up, if you want to send me a message ahead of time to say, Hey, listen, I'd really like to talk about this, but I'm kind of embarrassed to bring it up. You know, so many times it's people are surprised to learn that those things are associated. And sometimes we can make adjustments to medications Absolutely, uh, if, if that's related. Absolutely. And, and I think having the comfort factor to discuss, it kind of comes up with another idea. Like you had mentioned, I'm part of the women's neurology group. It's not mm-hmm. specific to movement disorders, but it's all women neurologists of all specialties, but in movement disorders itself, we are lucky that more than half of our, you know, professionals in the field are women. So if that, if that is important to someone, for some people, it doesn't matter, but if that is important to someone to, for a woman patient, to speak to a woman doctor, you have a high likelihood of having that be available to you in the movement disorder world. And it's something that you should seek out because again, this is going to be your partner. This is going to be the person that you can come to and ask questions of all flavors. Um, And if they don't have the answers and they can help guide you to those that might. So again, forming that support system and what some of the research has shown in specifically how women manage chronic conditions and diagnoses is that the 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 support network is exceedingly more important for women than it might be for a gentleman patient. That's not to say that they don't need support as well, but since women are the ones that usually spearhead that network to begin with, having it be an integral part of our treatment plan and paradigm is important to make sure that we have it in place. And again, getting back to your being your own advocate, look for the doctor that you think will be the best partner in that. Yeah. in that path. And it's, you know, we, we sort of talk about it is sort of, you know, stereotyped or typical gender roles, but it is often women who are, you know, like you said, spearheading a lot of the social support and social activities, but like who takes care of the caretaker, right? When you've right. always been that person and mm-hmm. now you're the one that needs help. Mm-hmm. A lot of times you, you know, it's, it's not to take anything away from any spouse or anything like that. It's no. just a different dynamic. And so it is a different dynamic. Able to find right. that. We, um, I had a medical student rotate through clinic this past week and it didn't even register until the medical student asked. And she asked me, she's like, do you specialize in women and Parkinson's? And I said, no, why? I'm like, I actually don't know if that's, I don't think that's a specialty as of yet. And she said, every patient we saw today was a woman. And I was like, oh, you're right. Like looking back and that's not necessarily the norm that we see. So I think people try to kind of do that on their own to some degree, but I'm just putting it out there as it, it's okay to do. <laughs> like go, go, go and seek out your best confidant and your best support. So one question that came up that I think may probably worth addressing now, since we just talked about it is maybe broadly, just talk a little bit about some of the medications that can affect libido, sexuality, erection. Sure. Well, not for yeah. women, obviously. But. <laughs> sure. So one of the things that has come up I- Again, and we talked a little bit about the the, the differences in in symptoms for men and women in Parkinson's disease. Side effects of medications are also slightly skewed based on gender. From a motor point of view, that's dyskinesia. So risk factors for developing dyskinesia are usually younger patients, thin patients, and female patients. And the question for that is, is it hormonal? Is it something with the interplay with the estrogen or is it a weight-based consideration since gentlemen tend to be larger um, patients? Renal clearance tends to be the same across the board. So we don't think it's it's any excretory issue or anything like that. From a um, non-motor point of view, the medications that can tend to have non-motor side effects of reduced libido and things are actually the medicines that we use for mood. So medicines like SSRIs and SNRIs and things like that are antidepressants, Celexa, Lexapro, just to name a few, not to go through the whole list, but things those tend to be common ones, Zoloft that are used in the Parkinson's world. They can have a decrease in, in libido. The medicines that can then have an opposite impact or hypersexuality are really the medicines that we all use to manage Parkinson's motor symptoms. So anything that works on dopamine, the ones that have the biggest impact are the dopamine agonist medicines like Pramipexol, Ropinarol, Mirapex, Requip, Nupro, things like that are the medicines that can sometimes have that hypersexuality component for the impulsivity and the compulsivity side effects. Sometimes they can 
have not just hypersexuality, but also increased spending, compulsive cleaning, like whatever it might be that goes along with it. And, but regular carbidopa levodopa can as well in its various forms, depending on the dose that they have. To a lesser extent, the medicines that don't work on dopamine, but are classic in Parkinson's, things like amantadine, artane, stuff like that. But if ever looking at the side effect profile of all of these medications, it's really the dopamine agonist and the higher doses of carbidopa, levodopa that can have the hypersexual side effects. And I think it's interesting, obviously it's not always the case, but so right with the dopamine agonists, these medications that work like dopamine, as opposed to replacing it, like we do with levodopa, that sometimes there's even gender differences in the types of impulsivity or the types of yes. compulsive behaviors that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that or. I'm so I, I mean, from a, between men and women, it's not necessarily porn watching and things like that from a, a female point of view, that the hypersexuality in those regards tend to be more on, uh, on the male side. But I, again, not to be gender, you know, derivative cleaning hyper, like it, it, the, the compulsivity for organization and cleaning and keeping things in a very fixed, regimented, organized way it's things that we've been doing our whole life, like managing family and everybody else. And so this then goes to an extreme. I've had some patients that don't mind it, to be perfectly honest, that they're like, <laughs> I'm more efficient now than I've ever been. Okay, we'll just keep an eye on it and let it go. But for the most part, it's it's exhausting and daunting. And it's something that we have to adjust our, our dosage or, or medication regimen completely for. Yeah. Right. It's at the expense of something else. Something else. Yes. But I had one patient we had to, I think she was on, I think she was on Repinerol and we had to back off because of this comp I mean, she was like cleaning the baseboards with a toothbrush yeah. in the middle mm -hmm. of the night. And she used to joke, she's like, Can I just can I just take two on Sundays? <laughs> because right. I'm so much more efficient. But mm -hmm. it's it's interesting how, you know, both, you know, men and women, right, assigned male or female at birth. Yeah. Um can have compulsive spending, but sometimes, you know, right. The men may be more likely to do cars and sort of, mm -hmm. sort of you know, items like that. Whereas women, it may be more shopping yes. or organization, things like that. Yes. So mm -hmm. interesting. So we've talked certainly about sort of the postmenopausal stage, but right. We certainly have a, a group of women who are still yeah. in the childbearing ages. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and women who, you know, are thinking about pregnancy or, or how we counsel patients on you know, when so this is definitely something that's emerging. This is not, and this is across neurology as a whole, women in women, patients in neurology of childbearing age are now getting more of a, of a closer look in the sense that from a political point of view, there's lots that go on with um, concern for medications and harm to the fetus and especially in the epilepsy world and things. So it's become more of a focus and a forefront. In the Parkinson space, luckily that harm is not the case or the concern in the sense that we've used dopaminergic meds for other conditions like dopamine responsive dystonia in children without problems. So things like levodopa are something that can be used. So that takes a a big hurdle and a big burden off of how are we going to treat or manage these patients? Right. But that's just the medication aspect of it and, it. and it's nothing else. So it's looking at how do pregnancy symptoms impact motor symptoms and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. One of the things that I say with Parkinson's is that it, it takes whatever is happening naturally and enhances it. Mm -hmm. So if you are going to be fatigued and tired in pregnancy, if you have Parkinson's and are pregnant, then expect that you are going to be even more fatigued and tired. If you have significant, you know, rigidity, stiffness, tremor, whatever it might be, expect that as there's stress on the body, pregnancy or not, these things are going to be more pronounced. So you might need to take more medications or outside of medications, you might need to look at other things that can be adjusted in your treatment paradigm or, or daily schedule, a lot more time for rest. If you can, I mean, that's so easy to do, but in everybody's fast paced world, that's hard. But if you can 
sort of schedule it in an extra nap here or shorten your, you know, the amount of, of activities that you need to do in a day to make it more manageable. Do sort of proactive things in that regard. If you are noticing that your mood is more impacted, treat that appropriately. If, if it's treated with dopaminergic meds, great. If it's not, it needs to be treated more specifically with the medicines for, you know, serotonin, norepinephrine, whatever it might be, bring those on board. But it's important to be cognizant of the fact that there is a chemical reason for both the motor and non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. When you magnify that with the changes of the body and the chemistry in pregnancy, it is it should not come as any surprise that things might need to be treated more proactively instead of reactively. And as a population as a whole, pregnant women are also often ha handled with kit gloves because we just don't know how things impact the, the fetus, the baby, the mom, however it might be. And that's a disservice, obviously. And But like I said, for the Parkinson's space and for the medicines that we use in combination with our Parkinson's meds, we do have some more flexibility in that area because a lot of these meds are either known in pediatric world or have been studied to some degree. Right. I mean, there's a couple we worry about things like amantadine we know can, can right. have some risks, but those tend to be medications that we use generally a little later on. Yeah, yeah. certainly. Yeah. Certainly not first line for sure. Mm -hmm. And I've certainly had patients too, even in a right sort of outside of pregnancy that are just, they notice that there's variation in their symptoms around the mm -hmm. time of their menstrual cycle. Yes. You know, they, mm -hmm. they, when they're sort of in that pre, you know, mm -hmm. sort of PMS pre stage, right. you know, they, they notice that their symptoms become more apparent. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it just goes back to what you say that I always tell my patients, your Parkinson's is your tell, yes. right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. you know, you may have had a poker face before, so to speak, mm -hmm. but now you have a tell, you know, whatever's going on in your life. Well, like you said, we'll sort of can, can enhance or mm -hmm. magnify the symptoms that you're having. And I think it's, it's a really important thing to, to be aware of that there can be fluctuate, right? There's all kinds of reasons that there can be fluctuations in symptoms of Parkinson's this is just one more thing, right? If there wasn't enough, now there's one more thing <laughs> right. yeah. to add to the list. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think it's important too, because right. So many of the research studies that we do right now, like what are the exclusion criteria, right? If you're a right. woman of childbearing <laughs> age, you need to have some kind of, you know, birth control, yeah. which, you know, to be honest, I'd have to go back and look you know, are they, is it, can you use just condoms or does it have to be some sort of like chemical birth control? I don't know. I don't actually know the answer to that. I have to go back and look. I know there's been some where it had to be sort of ironclad, you know, yes. but mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a whole segment of women who either don't participate in research, which we know women in general are not as involved in research a lot of times yes. for a variety of reasons. Maybe they're not referred as often. Mm -hmm. Um, but that's a whole too segment of to too much going on. I can't take the time to participate <laughs> in that. Yep. Mm -hmm. But, but also, you know, if you have, if you have women in studies that are taking external sources of hormones that may change, right. The data. Absolutely. Absolutely. So there's another question that's come in. Are children born to Parkinson's moms more at risk of PD or other dopamine related behaviors later in life? No. The, the number of genetic, genetically confirmed cases of Parkinson's disease is still extraordinarily low compared to the, what we call idiopathic prevalence of Parkinson's, the Parkinson's that just happens as we get older and we're not quite sure why. So just being pregnant with Parkinson's does not increase the risk of the baby being born with a higher risk factor of Parkinson's disease. And I would say your yeah, child's risk is the same as having any parent yes. that, you know, if you, if you have a first degree family member that has Parkinson's disease and your risk is higher than the general population, mm -hmm. but it's not any different, whether it's mom or dad or right. sibling. Okay. So we have a couple of other questions that I'd like to kind of touch on. And you, you kind of touched about this a little bit, but, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit more about the importance of, you know, recognizing symptoms and building those relationships. What are some resources you mentioned a couple before, but what are some resources that patients can find to help them with a lot of these symptoms or a lot of these concerns that they're having? Sure. So again, if, if you don't know where to start, the large organizations are always good to start because they have, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. They have patient resource libraries, they have webinars, 
um, in their um, uh, online education bank. Um, they have print resources, particularly I'm thinking of the Parkinson's Foundation, that you can either print out off the web or request and they'll send you lovely packets and booklets, um, which are written at a very informative without being overwhelming level of um, information. If that seems daunting, like if all of that information available just seems overwhelming, then I would also say smaller support groups, if you have the availability to, to participate in them, either online or in person, depending on what's available in your region, is great because then you can ask the facilitator of that support group where they go for their information or what they recommend for certain, if there's a very specific thing that you're looking for. You can also, through the larger organizations and um, smaller networks, look out, look specifically for women with Parkinson's resources. Um, they exist. There are a number of support groups that are available for women in Parkinson's disease, um, again, either virtual or in person. And there are some resources that are available print-wise that have been written by women in Parkinson's disease. I don't know the titles of them off the top of my head, I'm sorry, but I do recall because I was at one of these um, uh, women in Parkinson's resource uh, support groups and they were mentioning that one of the members, particularly a woman from University of Pennsylvania, wrote a book um, about her experience of, uh, in, of, of being a woman, young diagnosed woman patient with Parkinson's disease and the relationships that she sort of collaborated with and, and developed along the way. The other thing that I would say is non-medical professionals, so physical therapists, speech therapists, the one that is probably most important but least accessible, social workers and things like that. If you are lucky enough to have a access to one of those, either through your the clinic that you're attending, um, through something like Synapture, or through I, I live in Princeton, New Jersey, or just outside Princeton, New Jersey, and they have the Princeton Senior Resource Center. And that Senior Resource Center is staffed by social workers. And that's where I direct a number of my patients just to kind of go and collect some um, practical information as well. So this, those would be the ways that I would say, try and tease out the best avenue of, of your resources. If you're looking for broad general things, the larger groups, if you're looking for things more specific, then seeing what might be available in your community to, to ask about what local resources there might be. Absolutely. And I always recommend too. you know, some people say, well, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to sit in a support group and talk about Parkinson's all the time. But on one hand, I think it's, a, it's often a good place to meet people who are maybe at your same stage in life that, you know, that just get it. You don't have to explain a lot of, they just get it. And right. There can be friendships that form sort of beyond the support group. But if you're interested in more, you know, if you're still very active, you know, find, find, you know, groups that do pickleball or tennis or running or cycling or all these different rock things, steady boxing, rock steady yeah. boxing, right. Yeah. A lot of the exercise classes that are PD specific, you will find other people who, again, they just get it. You don't have to explain it, but they're out being active, doing a lot of these things. And that can really be a huge, you know, source of support as well. So please, everybody keep the questions coming in. They're great so far. I have another question about, can we discuss a little bit about women and some of the advanced therapies, so like deep brain stimulation, focused sure. ultrasound? So again, like the, the common theme across the board, women are referred for these therapies less than male patient counterparts. But the encouraging thing is that when women are referred and they do participate in them, they have better outcomes than their male counterparts. So we, again, should focus on selecting the right patients for these procedures and maybe when needed, push our female patients a little bit more forcefully to consider them as opposed to just laying them out there as an option and then having them kind of put it off, put it off because again, whether it's other things going on in their life or they just don't feel comfortable going ahead for with such an invasive procedure or things like that, spending a little bit more time to really dig down and tease out what their hesitations might be. Um, we were, our generation of physicians, I think was 
the not being paternalistic was very much drilled into our head in medical school. Like you, you are not the know-it-all, you are not telling patients this is what they have to do and it's just that and that alone. So it's the conversation, which is wonderful. And it's the laying out of options, which is wonderful. Sometimes my patients will just tell me, well, will you just tell me like what you think I should do then? And I'm like, I can't tell you, like you have to come up with this on your own. But again, some of it I think is okay to say, you know what, we've discussed all these options. I really think this would be best. Like, I think this is the way to go. I think this is, and for reasons X, Y, and Z. So that is something I think we have to work a little bit better on, on our end with making sure that we are not just accepting a no and continuing on status quo. But if we really truly think that a pump or a, a DPS or focused ultrasound is going to be beneficial for management and quality of life, we should push a little harder. Yeah. And I always I tell patients all the time, like just what you said, I want to understand why you're saying no, it's okay to say no, but I just want to make sure that it's an educated no. Right. And it's the right education, right? That there's not misconceptions that mm -hmm. because they, those are certainly abound. And so we just want to make sure we understand, you know, the reasoning behind it. And I think it's important to, you know, I, I always let patients know, you know, there for some people, there is a window where if you get to a certain point, maybe because of cognitive issues, or maybe just because of other medical issues that make you maybe not as safe of a surgical candidate, mm -hmm. there may come a point where you're not eligible for DBS anymore. And so- right there's sort of a, you know, an optimum window, which is not, I mean, it's not like it's months. I mean, we're talking usually years for most people, but you know, it, it sometimes it's not something you can just put off and put off before you're out of that window. Yeah. Okay. And then I have another question. This is a little, sort of a little off topic. I think this gets a little bit more to, to the comment before about, you know, children born to, to women with Parkinson's disease are children exposed to drugs, especially stimulants in utero, more likely to get Parkinson's disease? That's a really good question. Actually an area of research, but we don't have an answer just yet as to what, if any, that exposure has. There is a large population study and, and resource called ACE. Why am I just blanking on what that stands for? It is Adverse childhood events, ACE. Yes, that's what. So adverse childhood events is a, it has been looked at in all chronic conditions, cancers, autoimmune conditions, things like that. But it is now being looked at for neurodegenerative conditions as well. And like I said, since it's not specific for Parkinson's, but you can sort of extrapolate some data from it. Part of this survey is people that were exposed there through to, to all different types of medications, either as a child and in pregnancy, people that were exposed to high levels of stress, whether it was, you know, unthinkable levels of stress, like being a refugee or a migrant or things like that, or somebody that just had suffered abuse as, as a child or someone that just had very, you know, a tumultuous childhood with lots of moves and things like that. So it's a gradient of levels of stress and what that has as a long-term impact on the dopaminergic systems. So it, I don't have a specific answer to your question, but I can tell you that's an active area of research. Absolutely. So I think that's the rest of the questions that we have so far. Actually, I lied. There's one more question of the three <laughs> types of classes of PD. She was asking if you could review those okay. again. So the, sort of the oh, three sure. typical presentations in Parkinson's. Absolutely. So Parkinson's is a spectrum. And what we call classic Parkinson's is really broken down into three different categories. There's tremor predominant Parkinson's, which is again, what it sounds like where tremor is the predominant symptom. There's a little bit of slowness, a little bit of stiffness, but really it's that tremor that may even be medication refractory. It's that, that is the, the symptom that is most bothersome to patients. The next down the line is akinetic rigid, which is a kinetic meaning no movement, so very stiff, very rigid type of uh, presentation. There may be not as much of a response to medication. There may not be much of an impactful tremor, but it might kind of peek in and out here and there. And the third type is the postural instability gait predominant, um, which is again, very little tremor, 
most difficulty with balance. So lots of retropulsion very early on in this patient population. That's that sensation of being pulled backwards or falling backwards. Uh, difficulty with initiating gait. So lots of short, festinating steps and a lot of freezing early on. Again, with not as robust a response to medication as some of the others. Down the line that you then go into the atypical Parkinson's picture, but they have different types of features associated with it that help you differentiate, whether it's a very poor response to medicine, a lot of cognitive issues or hallucinations or things like that early on, very much um, uh, an impacted autonomic nervous system. So the things that are supposed to happen automatically are very much impacted early on, like blood pressure. So getting very dizzy when you stand very quickly, not just the, oh, it happens every once in a while to everybody kind of a thing. And I think just to highlight what you said too, right? These are sort of the three typical presentations that we see, but certainly there is overlap. And as as the disease progresses, often people will have components of all three of those things. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. So I have another question. I have ALS and my mom has Parkinson's. I've known others in the same situation. Is this a coincidence? I don't know if it's a coincidence because there are definitely combo type presentations. There's an FTD ALS picture. There is a, uh, like a PD autoimmune picture. So it would be interesting to have a cohort of studies of people with your same family history to see if there is a variant in their uh, genetic makeup that makes them more predisposed to this. By no stretch of the imagination is it something that we are evaluating for or checking for people with Parkinson's. Do we check for ALS or anything like that? And likewise, for with ALS, do we check for Parkinson's? But there are a subset that do have two neurodegenerative conditions. And I think it's, so I always think about two things when I hear, well, three things when I think about this is one is, you know, common things being common, right? Parkinson's disease is very common, Mm -hmm. right? After over the age of 65, it's about 1% of the population. It's just common. So it might not be related. The other question, you know, the other thing is that sometimes when you start digging or, you know, if you're lucky enough and you can get a hold of records, mm-hmm. sometimes you go back and you're like, actually, I don't think this was Parkinson's. I think it probably right. was ALS, but maybe it was a different presentation or right. uh, so people kind of get, you know, sort of maybe a misdiagnosis or certainly these overlap syndromes for sure. Mm-hmm. I think these are all things that we kind of think about when we hear, but, you know, also we know that we sort of define all of these diseases mostly by their, certainly the symptoms, but often by the abnormal protein that's involved. And it would go, this one's the abnormal tau protein. So this is a tauopathy and this one's, you know, Parkinson's is alpha synuclein and that's a synucleinopathy. But we certainly know that in some cases there are definitely overlaps where you may not meet the criteria for one of these other, you know, abnormal protein disorders, but we certainly see some of that pathology. And, you know, for all of us, Every time we see you, we're always looking for things that don't quite fit. Just are there any red flags or are there things that just don't make sense? Mm-hmm. And whether that means, you know, we're more concerned about atypical Parkinsonism. So things that look like may look like Parkinson's disease in the beginning, but then there's these sort of, you know, telltale signs that emerge that make us think it's something else. Or is there some other, you know, entity that's coming, that's arising, that starts to raise a suspicion that, you know, maybe we're, we're, you know, yep. It's not, uh, you know, just Parkinson's or maybe it's not Parkinson's at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I have another question. I recently started getting dizzy a lot. Is this a side effect of Parkinson's? What can I do to get rid of the dizziness? Sure. So it can either be part of Parkinson's or part of the meds. So unfortunately it's a little bit of a double-edged sword at times. The, the, regardless of what it might be part of the first thing to do is drink more water and eat more salt. So Mm -hmm. that the drops in blood pressure are the number one reason for dizziness in Parkinson's disease and really across the board, even outside of Parkinson's disease. So if you are not taking a lot of Parkinson's meds and your blood pressure tends to run low, bump it up. We should be aiming for half our body weight in ounces of water a day. Do as I say, not as I do. This is the only water I've had today and I haven't drank even half of it yet. So I appreciate how hard that is. The other thing is if you're taking medicines that dopaminergic meds can drop your blood pressure depending on the amount or the combination that you might be on. Again, dopamine agonists are notorious for this as well. 
see if those can be adjusted, or if you have blood pressure medications on board, see if those can be adjusted. Sometimes we don't need to be on concomitant blood pressure medicines if our Parkinson's meds are lowering it enough or switching them to nighttime because everybody's blood pressure tends to go up as they lie flat anyway. So the those are the two things. If you have done that, and you're still feeling dizzy or lightheaded, then I actually have people, I recommend people go for a vestibular rehab evaluation just to make sure that there isn't any other process going on um, that can lead you to a more vertiginous type picture or a dis- disequilibrium type picture or things like that. Can you quickly just to make sure everybody understands the difference between maybe lightheadedness versus or orthostatic hypotension versus vertigo? Sure. So If it were to be classic to the definition, vertigo should be a spin. Lightheadedness should just feel like that feeling of like when you stand up and you're just like, ooh, I have have to catch my balance for a second. Again, even people without Parkinson's, they are squatting on the floor and they stand up too quickly. And it's like, oh, that that feeling is, is orthostasis or lightheadedness, but it shouldn't have a spin component to it. Not all vertigo has a spin component to it. Some of it also feels like you're walking on a boat or that you're just, it's more of a disequilibrium. Like you kind of have to catch yourself on two sides and you're not quite sure where your body is in space. Um, That is not caused by low blood pressure or problems with dopamine. That could be caused by peripheral neuropathy. You're not getting the right input. It could be caused by problems with your inner ear, you know, sinus infections, whatever it might be. That is, that's a completely different beast and handled in a, in a different way. The nice part is the vertiginous things tend to be self-limiting, whereas that orthostasis is something that's going to persist most times when you, when you are changing positions or, or things like that. And I always like to joke with a lot of my patients. I'm like, this is one of the few times that sometimes we can actually get rid of medications yes. rather than <laughs> adding them. So we can, maybe, right. maybe we can lower your blood pressure medication or maybe get you off of it yeah. um, because of either the Parkinson's or the mm-hmm. other medications you're on. And it's one of the few times in medicine, we tell people to eat more salt, eat more salt. Yeah. That usually yeah. is what yeah. patients like. And they're like, well, what will my cardiologist say? I'm like, you have your cardiologist talk to me and we'll have that conversation. Go, <laughs> go enjoy your pickles, go enjoy your yep. chips, do whatever you I'll want. Say, I always <laughs> tell people all the peas, pickles, peanuts, yeah. potato chips, yeah. Pork rinds, right? I'm, I'm in Atlanta, so pork mm-hmm. rinds are common around here. <laughs> so those are always things that, especially in the short term, if you're feeling yeah. really lightheaded, hydrated, you, there's mm-hmm. also little packets that you can buy that have yeah. not just the regular electrolyte ones, but there's some that are actually higher in salt content mm-hmm. that you can just keep in, you know, in your car, in your purse mm-hmm. or whatever, and you can just dump it into a bottle of water and it helps, you know, just in the short term can really help kind of boost your blood pressure up a little bit. And there's ways to check that, right? You can check your blood pressure when you're, you're flat in the bed. And then you sit up on the side of the bed and you wait a minute or two, Mm -hmm. check it again. And then you stand up, wait, check it again and see if there's big drops in those numbers that might indicate that, you know, that might be the cause of your, your symptoms. So, so we are right at an hour. There's still some other questions. So I will try to address some of these other questions after the fact. We'll, once we post this, I can um, make it in the comments um, for the Facebook live, but please, you know, for all of you continue to, 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 post your questions, post your comments. This is really helpful. Dr. Farmer, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you. Um, Likewise. So much for joining us. And I'll end with, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about Synapticure, you can go to our website, which is www.synapticure. Or for those of you who have a smart, you know, a a phone, you can just open up your camera app and hold it over the uh, QR code and it'll take you, you can just click on it. It'll take you to the website itself. So with that, we'll end there. And Dr. Farmer, I will see you at the movement disorders. Con- Actually, I'll see you at the movement disorders conference in Copenhagen. And then I'll see yeah. you in Philadelphia. the month after yes. that. I am looking forward to it. All right. Fantastic. Thanks everyone. Right. Bye-bye. Right. Bye-bye.